So hello and welcome to the Cadre Journal. Today we have an interview with a comrade from Nepal discussing Nepali communism, uh, Narendra, and I'd like to begin by asking you to introduce yourself uh, to people listening. Okay, my name is Narendra Biswakarma and I'm Vice President of All Nepal a National Independent Student Union, Revolutionary, a student wing of Communist Party of Nepal. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just to begin, I'd love to talk about the history of Nepal itself to kind of contextualize uh, for people who may not know a little bit about the history. Can you begin by talking a little bit about what the development of communism was like in Nepal, the history specifically with the monarchy um, and how communist parties and communist movements came about in order to contest the monarchy? Yeah, uh, Nepal is a country, it has history of 3000 years and it was, uh, it's uh, located uh, between China and India. From Northern side, it, uh, there is Tibet of China and from South, West and East, East there is India. And it has almost history of uh, 3000 years and uh, before the modern history of Nepal, uh, I mean, before the uh, establishment of Kingdom of Nepal, a Gorkha Kingdom uh, by Prithim and Saha, that is modern history. Uh, it's uh, from 1768. So uh, geographically, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's situated in the laps of Himalayas and there is uh, there are plains uh, linked to Ganga of India. And there are, the country is multicultural, multilingual and multi-religious and it's very diverse society is here. So, uh, in the history, Nepal was never colonized by any country or any empire, uh, I mean, in the history. So it, it was like a country, uh, independent country since then. So uh, there, there were fights uh, with uh, Tibet and uh, uh, British in the history, uh, even in the modern history, but uh, Nepal was not defeated and it was not conquered. So uh, it has, there is a, a tradition or culture of like, uh, a, re a culture of a revolution or rebellion culture is here in Nepal. So, uh, as you see, communism, as you talk about communism in Nepal, it was uh, introduced a little bit late as Karl Marx wrote a uh, communist manifesto in 1848. But uh, in Nepal, uh, the communist movement was uh, started only after 1930s. I mean, uh, it was mainly introduced uh, from India at the time. In Nepal, there was a Rana, uh, autocratic Rana regime was here in Nepal. Uh, the Rana regime at the time, they, I mean, uh, did not give a uh, right of education to the student or to the people. That's why the young, young people were fled to India to first study. So at the time in the India, there was independence movement going on against British. So uh, Nepali, Nepali communist movement mainly it was uh, influenced by the Indian independence mo movement it itself. The young students who were in India to study, they participated in uh, Ind Indian independence movement and they learned about communism or Communist Party of India in there. So Nepal Communist Party was established in uh, 1949, April 22 in Kolkata, in India itself. So after that, uh, it's almost about, about uh, 70 or 71 years of history of Communist Party. So there were uh, lots of uh, ups and downs, turn and twists uh, in this uh, time period. The Nepali Communist Movement, I mean, it uh, gained or it uh, brought uh, revolutionary changes or it uh, get, it got, I mean, very good things in society too, but it had some negative things also with it. There were a lot of divisions and factions in communist uh, party. So if you talk uh, today, if you see today, there are like dozens of communist party here in Nepal. Some of them are in parliament, some of them are in government, some of them are in the streets, but the overall situation is not as good as, good as uh, it should be. So it's the thing, if you, if you see the history, uh, it's mainly the history of struggle. I mean, from from the very beginning, the Communist Party has uh, gone through uh, several struggles 
Amas struggle, arm struggle, and the different moments. So it has both the glories and the some I mean, negative aspects too. Thanks so much. And, and thanks for noting that as well. It's something I wanted to ask you about is as the history of the different communist parties continues after the 1930s and 1950s, uh, something that I've seen in, in doing a little bit of research and, and trying to learn a bit before talking with you is how many splits and how many different factions there are. Can you explain some of the main issues that motivated the different the tensions between the different parties that would emerge, the divisions, especially leading up to the 1990s when the Maoist faction would engage in the, the civil war and the people's war? Uh, if you see the initial days of Communist Party of Nepal, Ed, it was established in 1949. And if you see after three years of, I mean, establishment in 1952, it was banned by then government led by Nepalese Congress and Ranad. So after three years of its establishment, it was banned. And after only four years of banned period, it was the ban was lifted. So uh, even if um, there was uh, one sort of democracy, the Rana regime, I mean, was ended at the time, it was abolished, but uh, the that that revolution was not it was not a radical thing. It was like gradual change. There was gradual gradual change, and a little bit change was there. So, communist party at the time said that this is not the not the thing that we were fighting for. The direct autocratic Rana rule ended, but the people what the people are were searching, what the people were fighting, that was not there. So, after a few years of uh, establishment of communist party, there was faction like there was two. Uh, tendencies in the communist movement. One was uh, they wanted to uh, go with the monarchy. So they wanted to go with the monarchy and another faction that uh, they wanted to go to people's democracy or republic. So there were meant two streams at the time. And after 10 years of uh, establishment of democracy in 1951, in 1960, the, the late King Mohindra at the time, he uh, committed a bloodless coup and he uh, banned all the parties and he introduced new system of uh, he called it on-site system and it was a party-less system so it was a bloodless coup but he banned uh, all the parties and he imprisoned uh, prime minister bp Kodela. at the time he was prime minister uh, elected prime minister he imprisoned him so that system uh, um, it was like implemented for 30 years since then till 1990 so in that time, uh, communist movement, uh, I mean, it, it fought against that too. And in, in that period, there was another movement uh, in Zahapa district. It, it is a, a district in uh, uh, East Nepal. So there was another movement. The, the young people initiated another movement there. It, it's called Zahapa movement. So that is a one uh, uh, main uh, movement and the branch of communist movement uh, till now. And now it's called uh, Communist Party of Nepal, UML. So it's one branch that started there. And uh, after that, another stream of communist movement is that in, the, in, in between the, uh, that time, there was like, there were a lot of divisions like splits in communist parties. So after 1990s moment, there was another moment after 30 year of uh, Panchayat system. In 1990, there was another uh, people's popular resistance. So uh, in that moment, the, um, Panchayat system, party led system ended, uh, and constitutional monarchy and multi party democracy system was introduced in 1990. So, uh, even if uh, that was uh, that was a um, uh, that was also a gradual shift, gradual change. It was not a radical or revolutionary shift or change in political uh, arena. So, after uh, six years of that moment, Maoist party, uh, then one faction of communist movement, they uh, started People's War in 1996. So that was another uh, revolutionary moment, uh, uh, one of the uh, the biggest and the most revolutionary uh, civil war or the People's War of Nepalese history. So it was till 2006. So in that time period, after the revolution, uh, there there is there are like many things changed. The 240 years long monarchy abolished, uh, I mean, uh, it was in the history after that revolution. So uh, Republic was there. Now the new system, Federal Democratic Republic, it is after that war. And um, as you see, Nepal, in the history, 
it, it's a feudal country. It, it, there was a neighbor, it never grew up to a capitalist country. So it was feudal till now. There, it's, it, it's like there are many remnants of the feudal system. So like you see caste discrimination, division of uh, society in, in the basis of caste, and there is like um, most discrimination and ownership of the land, so cultural things. Uh, there are different aspects of uh, feudalism he, um, still now. So at the time it was like harsh, the life of people, it was like very miserable. So the Maoist revolution, it's one of the uh, turning point of Nepalese political history. So nobody thought of uh, removing the king or monarchy that they have, they had like uh, 3,000, 300,000 armed personals and money and all the things. So they were ruling Nepal since last 240 years. So that was one of the major breakthrough in Nepalese history. Thanks so much. And, and maybe I'd like to talk a little bit more about what happened during the People's War, kind of to reflect on it a little bit. Um, because the I think a lot of people studying the, or who would be listening in the West and listen to this, find the idea of it occurring in the 21st century very fascinating. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the tactics that the the guerrillas were using and also how they were able to bring the monarchy to its knees, how they were able to get the monarch to abdicate and what the sort of process of transition was like uh, when the monarchy was collapsing? Yeah, uh, Maoist uh, people's war in Nepal, it, it started in 1996. But the leadership of Maoist party at the time, the leaders of that uh, people's war, they started thinking of it and planning a planning of it since very long of that. So uh, as I told you, there was a, a popular moment uh, in 1990 and the people's war started in 1996. In 1990, there was a, there was a, there was a big, big sense. I mean, the panchayat system, party list system ended and the multi-party democracy and constitutional uh, monarchy was established. But after six years of that, the people's war started. It was mainly um, communist movement. It was uh, uh, directed towards uh, ending the feudal system, semi-colonial and semi-feudal. At the time, uh, the party said that Nepal's condition is semi-feudal and semi-colonial. So it was not directly colonized, but it, it's in semi-colonial form. So 100%, there was no 100% feudal system, but it's, it was semi-feudal. So uh, they you know, thought of uh, overthrowing that system with monarchy and establishing people's democracy like uh, Mao Zedong did in China. So it was mainly uh, many things uh, that they uh, uh, brought is from Chinese uh, model of revolution that um, starting from the villages and remote areas, and starting with the uh, small troops and guerrilla warfare to the bigger one, to a higher level of warfare. So that was the strategy. And uh, there, the society in Nepal, it was like, uh, as you know, um, in, in past, the education was banned. I mean, the university here was established only, I mean, before 170 years. So if you see uh, in the world, it was like 1200 or 1300 years ago, there were universities in the world in different parts. So education was banned. Even uh, even um, till these days in the remote areas, people are, I mean, they have not seen vehicles. So there is no road, no, no electricity till now. So that's the condition. So if uh, we can imagine what was uh, the condition at the time. So the, the things that the Maoist party said, we have to overthrow this uh, regime, uh, the monarchy and the system, and we have to establish people's system, working class system. So uh, many people joined that revolution in the remote areas, in the cities. It was mainly based on remote areas. So they started capturing small police stations in, in the remote areas, in different parts, and gradually they increased their intensity of uh, military uh, actions. So side by side, uh, there was like political awareness in the people they joined the war and it was um, at the time it said that 80 percent of uh, nepalese uh, land was captured by the maoists around um, so it, it was like big big i mean achievement uh, for, for the per moment uh, in the in the world there were like many movements uh, uh, run by maoist or revolutionaries they were getting setbacks in in uh, peru in philippines in many countries in, in even in india it was like getting set back so at the time, 
uh, it was like flourishing in Nepal. So why they gained so much popularity? Why the people supported them? Uh, the war was they raised the issue related with people. They raised the issue of uh, women inequality, gender inequality, caste-based inequality, and uh, the issues of peasants, land reform, and uh, the issues of um, uh, workers in the factory. So that's why. And at the time, the monarchy, it was like very feudal. And the political parties, after the change, a uh, political change of 1990, they were heavily involved in corruption. Corruption. And uh, there was instability in government and ministries and everything was like, uh, it was very turbulent. So that's why the people supported the Maoist movement and it, it gained control over 80% of the uh, country. So at the end, what happened was in 2005, um, then King Ganendra, he uh, again uh, took power, took uh, control of the government. He, he imposed his direct rule in 2005. Before that, uh, from 1992 to 2005, there was a prime minister system. He governed the prime minister, exercised the executive power. But in 2005, he, the king said that the parliamentary parties, they, you, uh, they couldn't handle the um, country. That's why he took direct power. And the parliamentary parties who were in peaceful protest against king and the Maoist uh, revolutionaries who were in people's war, they uh, made an agreement between and um, uh, to overthrow the king and to establish a republic. So that was the point uh, the history of Nepal changed. The parliamentary political parties, Nepali, Nepali Congress, CP and UML, uh, and five other parties, seven other parties, and the Maoists, they made an agreement and they uh, conducted a popular movement together. And um, then the monarchy was abolished. Thanks so much. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role of the international community, uh, specifically imperialist countries during the Civil War. Uh, from reading a little bit about it there, you know, you have incidents like the U.S. State Department uh, declaring the Maoist Party a terrorist organization and sending $12 million to train the Royal Nepal Army and supplying 5,000 M16 rifles. You have uh, Belgian arms companies delivering five 5,500 light machine guns to the monarchy. So you have this kind of intervention from the international community, from the imperialist powers to support the monarchy uh, and fight against the Maoist. But at the same time, the as you're saying, the Maoists were able to come up against a 300,000 strong army, a, a very powerful army from the monarchy, as well as international support, um, which shows, I think, as you're saying, the support they had among the people. Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, it's like in every other revolutionary uh, moment in other countries, it was similar case in Nepal. As we know that theoretically, American uh, imperialist uh, state power or the uh, government, uh, they don't, I mean, they always uh, uh, go against the communist and the revolutions. They have done it in history and they will do it in future too. So in case of Nepalese uh, people's war, uh, at the time, uh, the Maoist or the people, they used to say that uh, to Nepal army, it was uh, a Royal American army. So it was named like Royal American army. It was not Nepalese army, Royal army. So uh, they gave them uh, technical support and financial support. And they, I mean, listed all our leaders in, I mean, our party in terrorist organization, all the things they did, it, what they have done in history and till now. So if there was no American support to uh, Nepalese army, they would have, I mean, defeated very long before 2006. So if you compare uh, the technical, uh, um, technic if you compare technical in te technical things and in a number of persons or in uh, financial things, financial issues, uh, People's Liberation Army at the time, it was weak. It was um, in number or in technology. They used to have helicopters in, and, and lots of ammunition and all the things. So uh, the People's Army, People's Liberation Army, they fought with courage uh, for ideology for people. So even if it was supported by uh, the Americans or Indians uh, or the European um, companies or the governments, uh, they, they could not defeat um, People's Liberation Army during the war. 
So uh, we can see in history in other countries too, like in, in Vietnam, if you see they, I mean, they supported the West one, uh, but uh, they could not win. They could, uh, I mean, they could not defeat the communists or Ho Chi Minh's uh, their team. So their army. So it's it's same like here in Nepal. And uh, uh, Maoist party at that time uh, during the People's War, they uh, they not only participated. I mean, uh, in uh, military actions, but side by side they built uh, uh, things of state, a parallel state like education, health and uh, law system, judiciary system. And they, they started to build that in, in like communes or base areas. So um, in the end, uh, when there was agreement between seven parties and the Maoist, like I, as I told you, 80% of the land was uh, in control of uh, Maoist and the government military forces, they uh, even could not march outside district headquarters. They were limited in fixed places. They could not go outside and march and, I mean, uh, control the other places. So it was the situation at the time. So, um, we, yeah, as, as you told, um, there was like heavy intervention or support to the uh, Royal uh, Army and the government at the time by the imperialist forces. Thanks so much. And I want to ask a little bit about what has been happening in Nepal since the end of the People's War. Can you talk a little bit about how, as the monarchy was being overthrown, there was a transition period and how the Maoist political party came into power in Nepal, uh, the process by which it created a new state and, and sort of what life has been like ever since? Yeah, um, after the war uh, ended, uh, people, uh, all the people of Nepal used to have a dream of new Nepal or uh, prosperous Nepal or uh, Nepal based on equality and prosperity and uh, end of all kinds of discrimination. As you see, as I told, uh, Nepal is very diverse country. Dif there are different uh, religion, different, I mean, geographically, it's like plains and a forest, uh, hills, forested hills and um, high mountains. It's like very diverse in terms of ethnic groups, in terms of language, in terms of culture. So. Uh, as there, as it's drivers side by side, it uh, there is discrimination, like against uh, women, against uh, lower caste people, or against uh, Madhes, or against different ethnic groups. So it's very complex, or it, it's like a mixed of many things. So, and these issues, these uh, problems were uh, not born in single day. They were accumulated since very long, since since starting. So. Uh, Ma what Maoist movement or the people's were promised was is to solve all these issues. So they said that we will solve all these problems. We will solve these issues. So that's why people supported them. But the irony was when Maoist came to peace process, when the uh, monarchy was abolished and new ne the, there was time to build new Nepal. So at the time, uh, there is failure. There is big, I mean, irony or there is failure to establish new things to um, uh, if to to make new nepal or to move forward so what what we what is the situation now is uh, there was war many people sacrificed their life and there was i mean a 10 years long war and movement all these things were there but what we brought after that it's like uh, there is huge i mean uh, gap between what we promised during war and what now is if you see, um, it took like 10 years to uh, constitute a um, constitution, to make a constitution. Since 2018, only in 2015, there was constitution after that, uh, after the war. So it took very long and there was like uh, political parties, there was, there was, uh, they were delaying in delivering things and there was foreign intervention in all the things because people wanted a radical change. The people wanted radical change instantly, but the uh, old fashioned parties in Nepal and uh, there was very intervention from abroad and uh, it couldn't be as people demanded or as people desired. So that's why there is like a contradiction now. The current contradiction is what uh, people wanted, what people, what the political parties promised during the war and the, what they are delivering now. 
what's the situation now? That is the major contradiction now. So in this case, the political parties, Maoist, uh, who led the People's War and the other political parties that participated in the uh, 2006 moment. So they could not deliver a thing. There are changes. If you see, uh, there are some uh, fundamental changes like uh, there is uh, Republic is there. So at the time it was like uh, uh, monarchy was there, but now it's in a Republic system. So federalism is here. Uh, the people, uh, they are aware of their uh, uh, rights, but uh, it, it's, it's in, uh, in terms of awareness, there is, uh, there, there is some change. But if you see uh, the basic fundamental things in the, in the constitution, they have written everything. Like if you see, there are 40 or 50 fundamental rights that like you will get free education, free health, free transportation, and free everything, entertainment, all the things that these are communication, all the things they are in the constitution. But if you see in delivery, Nepal is in huge crisis. If you see in political way, it's very unstable. After Even if after 2015's uh, constitution, new latest constitution, no government can um, run for five years. So ministers, they are, they are being changed within three or five months or six months. So politically, it's very unstable. And if you see, in financial way, in economic way, it's it's in, in near nearby near the ease of disaster. So, uh, what they promised and what the people, I mean, at the, during the moment of revolutionary revolution time, they uh, desired or uh, fought for, it's not being delivered by the government or the by the uh, the leadership or party what they uh, promised. So. Uh, what um, that's why our party we are raising these issues. So what we say, what we are saying is, uh, we promise to the people different things, but we are not delivering. The system is not delivering. So uh, th that is the major contradiction now uh, in Nepal. Can you talk a little bit about the role of students in modern Nepal after the revolution, after the People's War? how you as a, as a student and as a young person are reflecting on all of these needs that you have and, and the need for education, the need for a better future for the people of Nepal and how there, there comes a time for a new generation to sort of represent these views. Um, what are the, the interests and what are the needs of students right now in Nepal? Yeah, uh, the issue of education, it, it's a very important issue. And during the moment or uh, during the revolution, people uh, talked about other political parties, talk about these things very much. It was the major issue. So after the revolution, what we thought was uh, they, they will change the system in a very good way. So, but if you, if you see now, uh, they have not done anything. What was uh, before is imp being in implemented right now too. If you see the education system here in Nepal, uh, in school level, like uh, in the schooling level, uh, there, 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 is, there are two types of education system. One is government, uh, publicly one, and another is private. So uh, people with money, they go to private schools, but people with uh, poor fi uh, financial background, they go to government public schools. So uh, the private schools, they, they, they are doing their business. It's, it's for money, they are doing for business. And the government schooling and the government uh, public institution, academic institution, they are of very low quality. So students who study there, they even can't compete with, I mean, other other private schools. So there is um, there is there are two systems that makes two. Uh, they what we say is uh, that the two systems uh, they are being implemented here. They uh, start to build two classes of people. One, one who uh, are families uh, of remote areas or peasants, family or workers, uh, children, they go to government school and the people who are of middle class and the higher class, they go to uh, private schools. So that is one major, major problem of our education system that the government has done it intentionally. It has, it, it's in, uh, I mean, it, it, um, uh, legally, they have done it. So it, what we say is it's a big discrimination towards Nepalese children or students because the government should not do it. They should provide the same education system regardless of uh, financial uh, status or uh, geographical status and uh, social status. So we are demanding for that one. And another is 
if you see, even if the students are uh, uh, getting some education in university, uh, they don't, I mean, there is no opportunity for jobs or there is, uh, they don't have, they don't see any opportunity here in our country. Every year, there are like, like more than 80 or 90,000 students, they go abroad for their, for their study or to work. If you see, uh, uh, Nepal's population, it, it's like around uh, 30 million and 8 million people are outside Nepal. Mainly these are young people and the students. So this is the case. Even if they study uh, uh, here in our universities in Nepal, uh, most of the students, they go to first world countries to work. So that's another thing. And what we are raising uh, the issue is uh, education system must be changed. It's uh, the human resource. It has to be uh, linked with the natural resources of our country what the university, what the schools are teaching, I mean, it's not applicable here in our country. So that's why they, they I mean, they teach the things or courses or, uh, from, I mean, abroad, or they copy all the things from abroad. So that doesn't help to our nation to build. So people, uh, um, the students, they study, um, uh, but they can't do anything in, in practical uh, things. And uh, there is like, Another problem is even if the students get uh, some technical education, um, there are no industries to work. So we have to, what we, uh, the question that we raise uh, is uh, the education must be linked to the work, the labor. They have to work, the, the knowledge must be implemented. It the student must go to factories to work. So uh, as you see, Nepal is uh, still in, uh, backward economic status. If you see, Nepal is one of the uh, poorest country uh, of the world. So in Asia, it's in like uh, five or six place uh, place of uh, the poorest countries. So if you see the natural resources and the people, young people who who uh, can work, uh, it should not be like that. We have like uh, hydropower uh, potential, and we have in agriculture we can do many things, and our peoples and diverse climate. So it's, it's a very beautiful and very fertile uh, land or country. It should not be um, that um, poor or the conditions that be like what it is now. So these are the contradictions and uh, Nepalese education system must be changed. It should be equal, it should be scientific and it should be linked to uh, work um, or the industry. So uh, these are the major things and uh, the people uh, the young students uh, who are leaving Nepal for further study or to work is one of the uh, main problem. It's a problem of brain training. Uh, so most of the students, they are leaving the country. It's it's one of the uh, major problem too. Thanks so much. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about some of the past elections that have occurred uh, in Nepal. I saw I was in reading a little bit that there's also the uh, Nepal Congress Party that has played a role in the politics and elections after the People's War. Can you talk about this party and kind of its relations with the Communist Party, as well as how the Communist Party, you know, the Maoist Party or the different parties contesting have uh, played a role in different elections? And, and I wonder within that, if you can talk about the 2018 decision to try and merge the, the Communist parties together and how that was prevented by the, the post-revolutionary state. Yeah, Nepal, uh, Nepali Congress Party, it's uh, one of the oldest party of our country. And uh, in, previous, in, its, uh, in its initial date, it was a revolutionary party. It uh, was formed uh, against, uh, during fight against Iran, autocratic, autocratic Rana regime. And it was uh, formed, uh, established before two or three years of establishment of Communist Party of Nepal. So in its initial days, it was a revolutionary for They fought against um, um, autocratic Rana regime and they fought uh, against uh, Ponsai system. Uh, but later on, they uh, compromised with monarchy. They compromised with uh, the bourgeois uh, class or uh, the, uh, the uh, monarchy mainly. So that's why they leave the people, they left the people behind and they uh, went for their own uh, interest. So at the time, but now the situation is uh, Nepali Congress Party, they represent uh, a comparative capitalist class of Nepal. So 
what we say is that is that class is enemy of Nepali, Nepali people. So uh, if you say if you see um, this this party is leading uh, in the government since very long since last twenty or thirty years they are, they are constantly uh, leading the government they are in government they are ruling they are uh, ruling party. So if you uh, see the situation of people what what they have delivered it's like they have privatized the national um, industries and they have um, sold uh, rivers and water resources to foreign companies and um, like uh, they have endorsed uh, um, unequal treaties I mean they have made different treaties with different countries in, in unequal basis especially with India so all the things what they what they indicate is uh, this party now um, they don't represent Nepali people or voice of Nepali people. So uh, even if uh, um, in Nepal, like uh, what's the irony is uh, these parties are delivering very poorly uh, in the election. I mean, they use money and muscle and all the things and they again get um, get the vote and people, they manipulate the people, working class or the people. So uh, that's the situation. And uh, if you see the last time they passed MCC, one of the um, Millennium Challenge Corporation project here in Nepal. So uh, they are now, they have done a lot of other treaties, unequal treaties too. So this party is uh, not working for Nepali people. They don't represent uh, Nepali people's voice. So uh, in other hand, if you see the communist wing, um, CPN Maoist Center or CPN UML, there are two major communist parties. Um, in 2018, they were merged. And uh, what they said, uh, if, if we win, then we will tell you, we will make our country prosperous and our, our people happy. They promised with people and people uh, voted them in that election, in 2018 election, they voted them and they ran the government for three years. But in that three years, they did not um, deliver what they said, what they promised. And they fought, fought each other uh, for, for the post, for the, for the prime minister position. And they, uh, they were heavily involved in corruption. They were heavily involved in uh, doing unequal treaties with for, um, imperialist countries. So they could, they could not deliver, or they could not uh, show their, I mean, what they, what they told during the election. So people um, realized that, and they were not uh, authentic, or they were not a true or leader of Nepalese people. So now uh, there is a situation that Nepalese people, they, I mean, there is a huge frustration and huge, I mean, uh, disagreement with these parties, uh, communists as well as uh, the Congress party. Uh, they are different parties, they, in name, they are different, but what they do, it's the same. So there is no difference between Communist Party or Communist Party, one Communist Party to, uh, and another Communist Party or the Congress, they are same. They are the different shops, they sell same products. So, uh, in in last election, last local election, people uh, tried to. Uh, they in few places in uh, Kathmandu metropolitan city too. They voted uh, the a, a neutral, uh, independent candidate instead of politically involved candidate. So uh, people are uh, what people have realized is these current uh, political parties. They can't solve uh, people's issues. They can't. Uh, they are not able to uh, deliver. Uh, what people uh, need, so uh, because it has it has been proved, it has improved since very long. That's why people are uh, searching for alternative force to move forward. So uh, uh, you can say um, these parties who are now um, so-called in uh, ruling party in parliament or in the government, uh, they are failed to deliver what people want. Thanks so much for that that answer, and I, I wanted to ask a little bit as well about what the process of, of settling life back together after the People's War has been, you know, how have people who fought in the People's War uh, as guerrillas, how have they been able to reintegrate into society? Has there been a process of dealing with the, the post-traumatic stress disorder and the sort of issues that, you know, former guerrillas may have of having fought in this war um, and, and, you know, overall, what has been the process of putting society back together and being now in a state of peace um, and trying to keep a state of peace after the People's War? 
yeah, uh, during the People's War, uh, Nepalese society was uh, soft and it was like um, there was uh, there were a lot of changes inside society. So what uh, previously uh, followed principles or traditions, they were changed. And they were like uh, uh, the war mainly, the Maoist party and the, uh, the revolutionaries mainly targeted that one, the traditional feudal things uh, that was in mind or that was in culture, that was in economy, in every sector of society. So uh, it was a very, there was like a huge changes during uh, that war. Uh, people say that, or we feel that uh, in last, um, uh, before that, in, in 100 years, um, there was not such change that happened within that 10 years. So if you see uh, the culture of our society, Nepalese society or Indian society, it's, it's like very feudal, very like uh, superstitious. It's, 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 it's uh, people uh, believe in, I mean, uh, very religious. So they, they, they believe blindly in many things. So that, that, was, that was present in Nepalese society too. So during war, people, um, the party, and the revolutionaries and the people who, who were involved in that war, um, like they changed many things, many dimensions of um, social aspect. So after the war, um, what the people thought uh, to change or what they practiced during the war, it could not, I mean, sustain for very long after the war because of the leadership of um, communist Maoist party at the time, uh, because of their uh, settle their way to settle that things or to to make new evolutions. So uh, during uh, the revolution, they I mean uh, targeted many old uh, fashion ideas and all the things. But after the war, they could not um, preserve that or they could not um, make more evolution on that. So that's why uh, many people faced many problems after the war. Even the people who fought in a People's Liberation Army when they go went back to their homes and uh, there was no like uh, financial economic stability or uh, the united nation was involved in integration or uh, the, the peace process in the integration process of people so there were like more than thirty thousand uh people's liberation army uh cadre during the war but only 1500 of them were uh they joined nepalese army so race like uh, 28,500 20, where they are, there is no, no record. So no one cares about that. So it, it's a, a disaster in one way because the people who fought for 10 years in, with one dream and uh, one ideology, and now when they back to home, there is no, I mean, nothing is there. So these are the, some issues that uh, the uh, peace process or the, uh, at the time, a leader, leadership of Maoist party and the government at the time, they failed to do so. So many social uh, things uh, were changed during the uh, people's war. And after after the ending of war, uh, revolution, uh, when they went to their society, the society didn't accept that things. So at the time, um, that, there, was, there were a lot of contra contradictions too. So, uh, there were a lot of changes, a lot of, a lot of positive uh, things uh, that uh, revolution brought. But uh, because of the leadership of uh, Maoist party and the leadership uh, uh, who led the country after the war, they could not um, resolve those issues properly. That's why there are a lot of problems too. Thanks so much. I, I want to just ask uh, as well about the recent announcement that the the Communist Party of Maoist and the Communist Party of Nepal Unified Socialists will try to have a merger and try to have a common manifesto uh, for the elections, the upcoming elections. Uh, I think that was a very recent announcement just a few days ago. You know, what what are the sort of prospects for, as you were, as you mentioned very early on, and now we're reflecting on it a bit, the Communist Party itself is so divided. There are so many different tendencies and so many divisions and different factions. What are the prospects for trying to put those divisions and factions back together to present a, a unified front and, and try and contest these elections um, and potentially try and, as you were saying, try to address the role of the comprador class in the government? Uh, it's like in Nepal, 
the parliamentary parties, two parties that you talked about, they are parliamentary parties. And uh, the leadership of both party, they were in the same party or uh, they, they were in a single party. Uh, they united Maoist uh, Center, CPN Maoist Center and CPN UML. They were in the same party in 2018. And they got two third majority in the parliament in 2018. They were in the same party. So at the time, what we uh, said was, now uh, there is uh, some uh, gap or some problem in our system, political system here in our country. Like this parliamentary system, it's uh, implemented here in our country since last uh, 30 years. And it has, what it has given to Nepalese uh, Nepali uh, people or our country is poverty uh, and inequality. And it has made our country very dependent uh, financially and in other uh, terms uh, with other uh, different countries. Uh, they have brought uh, intervention of uh, impaired countries in our, our nation and they have uh, made our people's life miserable. The system and these leaders, uh, the leaders that you name the political parties, they are in, uh, they are ruling our country since like last um, 15 or um, 20 years. So what they have given, what they have done, even if uh, what they do is during the election, they combine, they unite to win the votes. So after the election, they like forget everything. So they run after money, they run after position uh, to, to become prime minister, to become minister. So they only do that things. So it's like uh, they are uh, deceiving our people. They are not working for our people. What, during election, they, uh, they, they are, they, they, even other parties too, they are like making coalition. So if single, singly, they, they want the people, they won't, I mean, get votes from the people if, if they go one by one. So uh, in the last election, if you see Nepali Congress and Communist Party of Nepal Maoist Center and Communist Party of Nepal um, Socialist, Unified Socialist, they were together. They were, there was coalition. So what, what, what's the meaning of that coalition? If, if they want to do uh, the things for people, they should go one by one. They should, they should represent, represent their, uh, they should present their uh, agenda to people and they should, I mean, ask for vote, but they don't have that, I mean, uh, moral, they, they don't have that because of their history. So at the time, the scenario is same. Uh, the election is coming, that's why they want to be united and they will go together. So when they win, then they will do the same. So what we uh, think is there is some problem in our system. So that what 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 was the meaning of that? Uh, our system, it becomes very unstable. So if you see uh, one prime minister, he can't uh, run the government for five years. In two years, in three years, they, they, want, they, they, they change. It's very unstable. And if you see the ministers, they change every six months or every, every year. So if uh, a person, a minister, he changes, he changes after six months, what will he plan for after 20 years or 30 years? He can't plan for very long. So. Uh, our system it, it, it's becoming very unstable and the delivery uh, and the and the uh, bureaucracy um, the permanent government that we call so it's heavily involved in corruption so there are three uh, parties that uh, are involved uh, in corruption and uh, to to make our country down it's, it's like one is political leadership they are uh, working against our country and people from their side. And another is bureaucracy. They are not working for our people and country. And other is uh, the businessmen, the broker and the middleman who work for foreign uh, corporates, corporations and multinational companies here. I mean, these three parties, they are ruining the life of our people and our nation. So uh, our party, uh, as you see, uh, we, we were banned from the government um, last two years. Uh, we, were, we were made open only last year only. So we are raising these issues because this current political system, political leadership, they can't solve uh, people's uh, issues or the country's necessity. They can't fulfill country's necessity. We have to change, we have to move forward. Now what we have said, the current uh, political system that is uh, now implemented is comprador capitalist parliamentary system. So we have to move to scientific socialist political system. It has to be uh, more stable 
uh, it has to represent uh, all the working class people, our nation, and it, it has to uh, eradicate all the uh, poverty and discrimination and all the things. If you see uh, Nepal is facing different challenges these times, like poverty, as I already told, political instability, economic crisis, and social discrimination, foreign intervention, climate change, all the gender inequalities, these are all the things that the people in our nation is, uh, is facing. But who will solve when these issues will be solved? It's not, there is no, there is no guarantee or there is no, I mean, bright side to see. So uh, in, in the current uh, system or uh, under the current leadership, current political system, our country cannot move very long forward. That's why uh, there are like um, uh, different parties and different groups and um, individually people, they are, um, there is like a movement is going on against the current um, comparative capitalist system and our party is leading that uh, movement. So that's why they banned us. And last year only we were opened our band red list and we are now um, working with people. Thanks so much. And, and thank you for, for answering all of these questions. I really appreciate the answers have been very thorough. I would just ask my, my very last question for you would be, if you can express a little bit of, of perhaps, I know you just said that, that it's hard to be optimistic considering the situation, but if you can just talk a little bit about the hope that you do have that, that you know, your party and that the different people in Nepal society who are interested in socialism will at the end of the day, definitely prevail and, and, and how that hope, that optimism keeps keeps you fighting and keep as a student keeps you going. Yeah, obviously, if, if we see our history of our country of last uh, uh, 70 years, uh, there were um, a revolution in every 10 years. If you see 2007, um, I mean, uh, 1960 and 70 and 90 and 2006, there, there were a lot of, I mean, in, uh, in every 10 years, there is big change. So after the um, um, war, after the people's war, what people or what our country wanted to is to move forward. But the system and this leadership, they could not deliver or they could not uh, uh, fulfill their promises. So now, again, the people, we uh, the people are saying that till when we should wait, uh, we should, I mean, beg or we should ask these leaders and these parties to do this. And do this. I like um, now the awareness in and people. It, it's spreading. I mean, in very rapid way. In like in because of uh, internet or all the things. Like people are very aware now. So what we think is this system, this political leadership must be, uh, I mean, abolished. This would, I mean, the new system must uh, be must we, we must brought new system we must move to scientific socialist system. There is like debate, huge debate. It's, it's not our blame to any political party or it's not our own thing. The, all the people are saying that. So even in Nepalese Congress, Communist Party, uh, UAML and uh, Mao Center, in all parties, there is debate that this system can't, I mean, um, stay for long. So what we think is uh, our party and different uh, people of uh, involved in different other political parties, the neutral, um, I mean, uh, the independent personals, and all the people. We should, if we fight together, if we raise this voice together, we can obviously uh, move to a better political system, better economic system, and uh, towards better future. So that's why our party uh, and uh, different other parties to other people independently, uh, all um, mainly all Nepalese, they are uh, looking uh, towards bright future. So we hope in near future, we will, I mean, get to our destination, our scientific socialist uh, system. Thank you so much, Narendra. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. I really appreciate you having come on to discuss this a little bit more and best of luck to your struggle of solidarity. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for having me here and giving me opportunity to express our views. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.